if, if we've never had the chance to meet before, my name is Jonathan and my wife Natasha and I are the lead pastors here. We're glad you're in the room. We're glad you're with us online. And this is, I believe, week five of a series of conversations we've been having called Launch Sequence. Launch Sequence, a series of events that set something into motion. And so we've been looking at the series of events right from the cross, the empty tomb, the ascension of Christ, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, these events that put the church into motion. And you know, for the early church in this season, everything's changing. There's a lot of new, there's a lot of exciting, there's a lot of terrifying. And so we've looked at Acts chapter one and Acts chapter two and Acts chapter three. And today we're gonna skip chapter four. We're gonna get right to chapter five. Are you ready? Wow, (laughs) that's (laughs) underwhelming at best. Um, You got time for 11 verses? Can we do 11 verses together? Okay, that's a little bit better. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan so filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? Well, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you've contrived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. He dead. And great fear, I was just interpreting for you there, (laughs) breathed his last. He gone. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down, breathed his last. And great fear, no kidding, came upon all who heard of it. The young man rose up, wrapped him up, and carried him out and buried him. Now, after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Peter said to her, dun, dun, dun. How is it that you've agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband, they're at the door and they'll carry you out. Immediately, she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. She did. When the young man came, young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Isn't that cute? And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Whoo! This is a spicy passage. I mean, think about it just for a minute. Everything, if you've been, I'm, I'm, listen, if you've been tracking with us the last several weeks, it's been pretty exciting and encouraging. If you're here for the first time, normally things are very exciting and encouraging. And today on this long weekend, I'm speaking to you who are here for the first time, but I know I'm also speaking to some hardcores, okay? You're here today. This matters. And so we can get into a difficult text because I know you're ready for it. I know you're well conditioned. So it's, it's all been kind of up and to the right, right? Like it's the, um, the disciples, they're, they're relating to Jesus in a new way. It's amazing. Through the Holy Spirit, they now have power on the inside of them. They're learning and adjusting to what this means. There's new confidence. There's new opportunities. After the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Peter stands up and he preaches and 3,000 people get saved. And everyone's like, man, this is amazing. Peter and John, last week we talked about how they reach out to the man at the temple gate and he gets healed supernaturally. Like the first time a miracle like this is recorded in scripture without Jesus being physically present. And so there's all these great things going on. At the same time, they're ridiculed and misunderstood and marginalized by contemporary culture. They're being threatened by authorities. Peter and John had even been arrested and spent a night in the slammer. But, but still, the church is growing rapidly in size, influence, and scope, and the community is getting larger. Faith is slowly going deeper. The testimony of Jesus is spreading wider. And it almost seems like they're untouchable, like it's all good. Then Acts chapter 5 shows up. And Acts chapter 5 hits you like the speed bump you didn't see coming. It it hits you like, dads, you would know this pain. You're wrestling with your kids. Everything's good. And all of a sudden, you catch a knee in the wrong spot. 
and there's a lot of emotions, like you're angry, you're frustrated, you're raging, you wanna body slam somebody, you wanna choke them out, you can't even catch your own breath, but because it's your child, you've gotta pretend it's all good, you're like, it's fine, it's fine, dad, are you okay? Why are you crying? I'm fine, I'm fine, it's good, I'm fine. Acts chapter five kind of reads like the speed bump or the gut punch, where you're just like, you kind of, they died, they didn't give and they died, and then you're like, it's fine, it's fine. Skip that story, let's go to verse 12, because verse 12 is really, we'll just skip it so we don't talk about it. Listen, it's a problematic text, because it seems like an Old Testament type of story. Hey, the, the stuff that we have a hard time justifying, like as long as it sticks in the Old Testament, we're generally okay with that. Like, because in the Old Testament, there was a law, and if you broke the law, which everyone did, there was consequence and a price that needed to be paid. And so when we read things in the Old Testament about the wars and the murders and all the different things that happen, and for a lot of us, instead of trying to really understand why it's there, we just think, ah, it's Old Testament. It's Old Testament. It's Old Testament. The murder, the judgment, the war, we'll just leave it there. And, and, and so we skip ahead to the new, and we expect the new to be really encouraging and uplifting, and Jesus loves everybody, and for God so loved the world, and it's all good, and, and, and he paid the price on the cross for our sins and covered, up, covered us with his grace, and now we're not perfect, but we're being perfected, and so we just need to lean into him and have a relationship with him. And so, so Jesus isn't about like the killing and the judgment. He's grace and truth, and he loves me. And he's the God of my second chance and my third chance, my fourth chance and my 34th chance. And he just keeps going and going and going. He's the gift that keeps on giving. And the <laughs> speed bump Acts chapter five. Did they get it wrong? Is it, maybe it's in the wrong testament. Maybe it's not supposed to be here. No, it's there, everybody. It's there. You read the story. I read the story. This is intimidating to me. They sold some property said they were going to give it all to the Lord, decided to keep a little contingency for themselves, which, I mean, seems reasonable. Who doesn't think I need a bit of a safety net? We all think that way. I think that way. But, but they lied to the Lord. That's actually the problem, right? Like, they said, I'm going to do this, God. And they told the whole community, hey, this is what we're going to do. And then they just pulled some back and kept it for themselves. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I know in this room, everybody's lied to the Lord. You probably lied to him yesterday. You know we have. God, I will never do that again. Ugh, tomorrow. God, I'll never do it again, again. God, I'll never. So I'm okay with feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I'm okay with a rebuke. But when I read this one and somebody drops dead in church because they got the offering wrong, I think, Lord, nobody would come to church if we preached out of Acts chapter 5 all the time. And if you're here for the first time, you're probably like, I am not coming back. I get it. I hope you do come back. So here's the thing. I don't understand it all. I can't figure out why these two died and why a couple chapters later, Saul oversees the stoning of Stephen, yet God sends a divine intervention to give him the opportunity to return or, or to turn to him. I don't understand that. I, I, I don't understand even the complexities of the situation. I, I, I got to be careful not to read into it too much. I don't know if, if they died and that meant they're not in heaven or if they died but their salvation was secure, I actually don't know. I can't make up things that aren't in the text. All I know is that I believe the entire Bible. I believe that everything that's written is written for a reason. So I can't pick and choose what I like. We can't pick and choose what makes me feel good. We can't pick and choose what my emotions want to be New Testament or Old Testament and just leave the other parts out. I gotta look at the whole thing and say, okay, God, if this couple walked into church and dropped dead and then got buried the same day and life went on, what am I supposed to learn from it? So I've, I've actually never heard a sermon on this text. Maybe you've never heard a sermon on this text. Maybe this will be the only one, and maybe that'll be a good thing. But you're here now, <laughs> so let's have a go. Now, the interesting thing about this speed bump is that on either side of it are very encouraging up into the right type passages. In Acts chapter 4, verse 32, it says the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. They're just sharing with one another. There's this beautiful unity in the early church. 
Acts chapter 5, verse 12 says the, so there's one side, there's this unity. Then on the other side of the, of the gut punch, Acts chapter 5, verse 12 says the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number daily. The community is growing. It says, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Now, could we just for a minute, maybe, and this is where I'm going to try and get some common ground. Could we agree that having a community where we're in such unity that we take care of one another, could we agree that's a good thing? Like, that's the goal. That's kind of what we want, where you're part of a community and a family where it feels like, man, there's some people here at Experience Church, they really have my back. Like, I know that God is going to take care of me, and he's going to use the people of my community to do that, and I'm surrounded, and I'm, I'm, I'm upheld, and I'm encouraged. We can agree that that's a good thing. Now, we can also agree, I hope, that Acts chapter 5, verse 12 is kind of like church goals. Like, if, if we could get to the point where everybody is so together. Now, the Greek word together is homothumadon, and it's a compound word that it combines to rush along and to be in unison. Eleven times in Scripture, this is the word used to describe the early church. Imagine, they are moving quickly in unison. There's a reason God moves quickly when there's unity, because if you move quickly and there's not unity, there'll be friction, there'll be damage, and there'll be destruction. So oftentimes when we feel like, Why, where are you, God? Why haven't you moved, God? What are you waiting for, God? He's actually waiting for us to get aligned. He's just waiting for unity, to be unity. But this is his goal for the church, that we'd be moving rapidly in unison. God, God is not, he is not a slow-moving God. The amount of times that God does something suddenly, and the reason the Bible illustrates, and I love the, where the Bible uses the word suddenly because it always comes after a period of waiting, as if to suggest when things were finally aligned, God suddenly, he moves quick when we're ready. So thank God for his grace that he doesn't move quick when we're not ready because it would do more harm than good, but he moves quick when we are ready. And so now you, like, it's ready, they're moving, it's happening. It's happening so fast that they don't even have time to get out anointing oil and have an altar call for people to be prayed for uh, because they're sick. Peter's literally walking down the street and he's casting a shadow and people are getting laid on the side of the street with every kind of sickness and disease, mental health, all these different things. And, and as he's walking by, the guy, a shadow is healing people. That's church goals. Church goals, isn't that the only time we'd believe for somebody to get healed would be when we've set the stage and we've told you a couple weeks in advance, we're going to have a healing service this Sunday. Come prepared, bring all your sickness. And then we've got the anointing oil out and everybody's ready to go. And all the prayer team has their masks and their breath mints and we're all ready. That's, no, 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 no. What if there was such unity and such speed that we couldn't wait for people to try and get up here. What if there's so many people that are reaching out desperate for the power of God that we don't have space to fit them all in the six feet that we've got between here. This is the splash zone, by the way, between here and the front row. If you ever sit in the front row, you know, I'm sorry. But what if you're walking down the street and someone gets healed because God is so in you and your shadow casts over them, and the power of God is released. This is the thing about Peter. He's a pretty normal guy. Do you, know, do, you know what, do you know what I learned about Peter as I was reading this? You know what I realized about Peter? Peter has a shadow. You know what dawned on me? I have a shadow too. It's right there. I don't think Peter was doing shadow puppets. I don't think he had a cute little dog bunny show and people were amazed. I don't think he was telling the story of the cross with his hands, doing like cross, Jesus. I don't think he was doing that. He was just so full of the power of God. Now, how does he have a shadow? He has a shadow because he's aligned with the light. So you and I all, if we stay aligned with the light, we'll cast a shadow so the shadow is not limited to Peter. The shadow is available to everybody. I believe there's an anointing over us that if we would stay in unity and aligned with the purpose and the plan and the will of God, if you would stay in the light, then God could use your life to cast a shadow 
supernatural shadow. So, I mean, even as we're singing this morning, I'm like, yes! This is the community we want. We want to be a house of miracles. We want crazy stuff to happen. We want people to get saved. We want lives to be transformed. And so you've got one side, the supernatural unity. On the other side, you've got this speed and this, this unity and these miracles happening. And in the middle, you've got this scripture that we all want to avoid. Ananias and Sapphira serving as a warning. So I want to go back. I want to look at verse 1 again and unpack a couple of thoughts for us today that I think are going to help us because, listen, we've agreed, right? We've agreed. The goal is unity, and the goal is that we'd be a supernatural community. So if there's something that God is giving as a warning in between those two things that says, hey, you want this and you want this, but you have to get this right, then we better pay attention to chapter 5. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But is the key word here. We did a series, not two years ago, a year ago, I like big butts and other conjunctions. Highly recommend. <laughs> but it's simply a conjunction. It's thrown in there to, to make sure we know that what you're about to read stands in contrast to what you just read. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 36 and 47, which comes directly before the story about Ananias and Sapphira, it says, thus Joseph, who was called, also called uh, by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So as the community was growing, they were coming to get together to care for one another's needs. This was done in part through the generosity of their members. This was not a sell everything and give everything to the church and everybody has equal amounts. Listen, that's radical socialism. It's communism. It doesn't work, okay? That's not what this is. This is people who had excess selling some of what they had and giving all of what they made to the church. Do you catch the difference? They're not necessarily getting rid of everything. They're saying, hey, you know what? I have some extra in my life and I could invest this extra into the community and in doing so, I can help other needs get met and I can help the community move forward. This is what's happening. It was about giving everything that they committed to give. So thank God, even in the early church, that there were landowners and business leaders, those who would invest in the life of the church, care for people who didn't have the same opportunities. And there's this one guy whose story gets highlighted. He was a hero. He's the example. Now his story, if everybody was selling everything and giving all the money, and it was a little communist village, then we wouldn't have the story of Joseph. But because we have his story, we know that what he was doing was an exception to the norm. It's radical. And it's funny because his name is Joseph, but the apostles are calling him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. So here's this guy, sells a field, gives all the money from his field to the apostles, and they use it to do things in the community. It's, it, he was an encouragement, a radical encouragement to the Christian community. Um, sells the property, makes a significant investment, it's like, hey, my name's Joe, uh, sold some property, want to invest it here into the Christian community. I'm pretty excited about what's going on. They're like, man, Joe, that's amazing. We're going to call you Barnabas. It's like, no, my, name, my name's Joseph. No, 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 no. We're going to give you a nickname. Your nickname's Barnabas because we are so encouraged by what you did. We're just going to call you the encouragement guy. That's kind of what this is, right? Like if it was today and, and somebody encouraged the community, it'd be like us saying, you know what? Your name's not really James. You're the encouragement guy. Hey, encouragement guy. That's what's happening. And so they're excited about it. Barnabas, this is amazing. You know, we're going to start an elementary school. We're going to put your name on the wall. It's Barnabas Elementary School. We're going to start a rec center. Barnabas Rec Center. We're going to start um, a sponsorship program. And it's going to be the Barnabas slash Joseph slash everybody forgets what his real name is now. We're going to just call it the Barnabas Scholarship Program. I mean, he is a hero in this community, Barnabas. I was thinking about that. I thought, man, if there's anybody in the room that's got a Barnabas calling, we're open to, hey, we're sitting on plans right now for an 18,000 square foot expansion to this building that would happen right outside that wall. Hey, this is, I'll just tell you where we're at. 
We have about one third of the money in the bank because you've been so generous and so faithful. And 18,000 square feet with a, a massive gymnasium, classrooms, expansion to EC Kids, mental health center. Like we're, this is, this is the, it's there. We got, I got the plans this week. So I'm just saying, if you want to liquidate some assets and throw a million bucks over, we'll put your name on the building. We'll do that for you. <laughs> easy, easy. I'll get your name tattooed on my body somewhere. You give a million bucks. I won't let you pick the spot, but I'll, I'll get it tattooed. Maybe in Greek or something, so it looks artistic, but it'll be your name. <laughs> so here's what happens. This is the story right before Ananias and Sapphira. You got this radical generosity. And, and so there's this celebrated character in Barnabas, but there's also this other couple who saw his recognition, saw him being celebrated. Wanted the same for themselves. Their motive in selling a property and giving was to get accolades. It was to get their name on the wall. They were under the pretense of being generous, just looking for attention. And so, yeah, we sold some land and we're really excited to give everything to the church too, just like Barnabas did. It's amazing. Peter's like, are you, are you really? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? This is the issue. He said, we sold this. We want to give it all. Peter said, I don't think you really did. I don't think you really do want to give it all. He said, oh, yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, that's the plan. Oh, Satan has filled your heart. Why would you lie? Why, why would you say you want to give everything to the Lord and then only give part? And if we're being honest, don't we make that same mistake all the time? God, I'm going to give you everything! Except, and then insert your area of compromise. We all have them. God, I'm going to give you everything! And, 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 and we believe the lie that we can have an impact with part. Wow. Wow. There is no impact with part. There's impact with all. There's no impact with part. And so they're believing the deception that, hey, we can just give part and we're going to be celebrated. We're going to have an impact. We can just give part. We can be partially in and we're going to get by. Listen, you cannot give God part and expect him to give you whole. You can't give God part of your life and expect to have the whole blessing of God poured out on your life. And Acts chapter 5 is a warning against trying to serve God in part. It's, it's a warning against, I'll make you Lord here, here, and here, but I'm going to do my own thing here. It's a warning against, God, I'll do whatever you want in my family and my business, but in my finances, I'm going to make the decisions. It's a warning against, God, I'm going to honor you in my finances, but I'm going to make my own decisions when it comes to my sexuality. It's a warning against trying to serve God in part. You can't just give him part. The beautiful thing about Christianity is it's an all or nothing deal. Is that he wants all of me and all of my heart and all of you. And that means even the really messed up, screwed up, broken parts. That's the, that's the beauty of the deal. He doesn't just want you where things are functioning well and working right. He wants you where your mind trails off. He wants you where you lust. He wants you where you long. He wants you where you envy. He wants you where you covet. He wants you where you compare. He wants you where you're insecure. He wants you where you're inadequate. He wants all. But so often we try and just give him part. Peter says, you didn't go all in. Satan filled your heart. And you kept part for yourself. It was interesting about that phrase, to keep back part, is that in the Greek, it, it, the, the word for keep back also translates embezzle. So it's a, it's a monetary term. And you can't embezzle from yourself. You ever tried to steal from yourself? It's weird. You always get caught every time. So the fact that Dr. Luke, who's an educated man, is writing this text and says, why did you embezzle 
part lets us know that there had been a prior commitment from Ananias and Sapphira to give all, not part. And so because they made the commitment to God to give all, now that he took some, he's stealing from the Lord. It's money that had been committed to the Lord that they, he was now taking for them, they were now taking for themselves and in the process lying about it to the community. Peter, guys, you're pretending. You said you were all in. You rolled up like you were all in. You've been hanging out in the community like you were all in. But how you handled your money has revealed what was really in your heart. And because you kept back on part, the significance, let's not get too caught up in the fact that they both fell dead and got dragged out. I don't believe that's going to happen today. In fact, I, I pray that it won't. <laughs> but let's not miss the fact that they missed out on the future God had for them. Missed out on the future he had for their family. Missed out on the impact they would have had in the community. They missed out on legacy because they held on to part. They held on to part. And it's not lost on me that in the same sentence here in Acts chapter 5, Peter says, Satan entered your heart and you embezzled what was God's. Satan entering the heart mixed with the monetary term. It's not the only time in scripture that the heart and money are mentioned in the same sentence. Matthew chapter 6 verse 19, Jesus is preaching and teaching and he says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay out for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, money, there your heart will be also. Our hearts are connected to our money. And where I put my money reveals what I love and what I love is where I put my money. And the devil wants us to be distracted chasing things instead of chasing down the creator. And so he's always drawing us to do things with our money that, that, and, and to pull our hearts away from God's plan. And so the first step really today is just all about, hey, how, we want to be all in. You know why? Because we want unity and we want to see miracles. That's it. How do we do that? Well, we have to get our heart right. And over and over and over again in scripture, the Bible tells us that getting your heart right means you need to get your money right. And so, listen, a couple things. We're not taking up a special offering. I grew up in a church where every now and then they'd do an offering, and if it wasn't big enough, they'd pass the buckets again. We're not doing that, okay? <laughs> um, uh, I, this is not, we, we don't have, yeah, we've got vision. We have vision. We got vision in this community. We have lots of vision. And you know, but you know what? We are okay with the vision for this house moving at the pace of the provision that God releases through this house. Do I believe that God has already provided the two and a half million dollars we need to build this expansion? I do. I just think it's in your pocket, but I, I believe it's here. <laughs> and, but listen, whenever, whenever God moves on us to participate is when he moves on it. This is like no pressure. We don't need the money. We're good. Bills are paid. So we're not taking up a special offering. It's not meant to be a big pressure thing. Uh, what it's meant to be is pastoral. And as the pastor, I didn't think I'd get emotional, but it was probably because I've had too many Red Bulls this morning. <laughs> as a pastor of this community, if we don't tell you what the Bible says about how to navigate your heart, then you are going to be facing difficulty that could be avoided if you actually knew what the Bible said about money. The Bible talks about money and finances over 2,000 times, prayer and faith about 500 times each. You can see right there that it's important. And sometimes we overemphasize. I almost, you know what? Even this morning, I almost switched and preached the message on prayer. Like it was last minute. I'm up in my office. I'm like, ah, I think I'm just going to talk about prayer today. And then God was like, mm, we talk too much about those things and not enough about these things. Do you know that 16 of the 38 parables Jesus taught were about money and possessions? I just feel like if it, was the, if it was the majority of his teaching, then we ought to make sure that we're, we're talking about it here too. And so three biblical principles on your heart and money. Three things that I think will free you up to experience God in ways like you've never experienced him. Three things that I'm, I'm convinced, if we can embrace them as a community, that we would start to see this divine unity and the outpouring of miracles that's modeled through the, through the book of Acts, 
like right here, right now in 2022 in our church, on our streets, in our home. The first thing, money. You should take notes. I'm just going to give you, you should probably, you should take notes. Sometimes I joke about taking notes. I'm just saying you should take notes, okay? Number one, we should be percentage givers. We should, when, when it comes to our finances, we should be giving to the Lord from a percentage. Malachi chapter three, verse six says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. So this is the interesting thing about being greed is you rarely notice your own. Because God is saying, I don't change. You keep turning away from me. You got to come back. And they're like, how? How did we turn? How do we return? And God says, well, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? He says, guys, you're blind. To it. You're not even seeing it. You do this in tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. that There may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I do not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord. Quick Math lesson, English lesson, all rolled into one. Tithe just means 10. 10%. So when Malachi the prophet says, bring, and he's, he's uh, speaking for God here, when he writes this down, God is saying, bring 10%, bring the tithe into the storehouse, which is a church that you trust, a community that you belong to, bring it into the storehouse. So 10% is just, that's 10% of all we receive, we give back to the Lord. It's in the Old Testament, even before the law. It's in the New Testament. Um, and, and listen, here's the deal. Don't come to me for advice on Bitcoin. <laughs> don't, don't come to me uh, for stock advice. I listen to some podcasts, but I, they're confusing. Uh, don't, don't come to me for like a financial plan. Uh, I'm not your guy. But I feel like I can stand up here and say, I'm an authority on tithing. You know why? Because since I was seven years old, delivering the Brant News for like half a cent of paper, which to be honest, my dad did most of the work, but I have always taken, because it was ingrained in me from like being a little kid, that anything I get, like the, anything, I take 10% and I give it to the Lord. So I, I can say confidently that for the last 35, 36 years of my life, that every time finances have come my way, I've taken a minimum of 10% and I've given it back to the Lord because that's his. In fact, it's all his. I'm just stewarding the gifts that he's given me. And so when it comes to finances, I mean, it's, it's, when I give him back 10%, it's me just saying, hey God, thank you so much for everything. I give him back 10. It was a value ingrained in me by my parents and the beautiful thing about understanding percentage giving is that it breaks down all the walls and weirdness in a community like this. Because you can percentage give if you make $3. You can, give, you can percentage give if you make $30,000 or $300,000. It doesn't matter. We can all give the same percentage. And, and so God says, I want you to bring 10% into my storehouse. Not because God needs the money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's good. Um. God can speak something into existence and it just happens. He's giving us an opportunity through the tithe, a pattern. A this is a spiritual discipline. You know, like reading our Bible, worship, prayer, attending church. Those are the comfortable spiritual disciplines to talk about. Tithing is also a spiritual discipline. When I become a Christian, I begin to tithe. Why? Because it's an opportunity for, to, for me to express worship and gratitude for me to say, God, you've been so good. I'd have nothing without you. I'm going to give you this 10. And God, I know when I give you 10, you get involved in the 90 I have left over. This is a reminder to my soul every time money comes into my home that, uh, that my provision and my satisfaction and everything I have comes from him. The benefit is that he sees my expression of trust and gratitude. And then he gets supernaturally involved in my life. This is the only two-way test in the Bible where God says, test me in this and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven, get supernaturally involved.
Now, oftentimes we can be so narrow-minded as to think that the only ROI in God's economy is that we change, exchange dollars for dollars. But think about it. He says, I'm going to open heaven. Gold is of such little value in heaven that it's used as pavement. The streets are laid with gold. So I, if that's God's pavement, I don't want him to send me the roads we'll walk on someday. When he opens heaven, I want all the other stuff. I want God to be supernaturally involved in my family, which is more important than money. I want God to be supernaturally involved in my marriage and my relationships, which you cannot buy that kind of health and quality of life. I want God to be involved in my physical body. I want God to be involved when I pray for people to get saved and they get saved. I want God to be involved in changing and transforming our community. I want God to be supernaturally involved in every area of my life. And he wants to open heaven. So don't limit it to like, okay, God, things are tight, but I'm going to give you 10% and I'm expecting at least 12 in return. What? What if he, what if he gives you healing? Amen. What if he gives you forgiveness? What if he gives you joy? What if he gives you peace? Are these not worth more? God doesn't curse us. It says you're under a curse. God doesn't curse us if we don't give. So I don't want you to be like, church said, if I don't give, I'm cursed. No, you're not cursed. Here's the deal. Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the garden, they brought a curse on the world. And God, over and over and over, is giving us a way out from under the curse. Tithing is the way out from under the curse. It positions you for his blessing. He's not cursing you because you don't give, but he's saying, if you do, you'll get out from under the curse. Man, remember, like, uh, I love Canada's Wonderland. It's like the crown jewel of entertainment in Canada. And they got, I think, I can't remember the name of the water ride, but they got this one water ride, and, and you stand on the bridge, and if you're on the bridge, when the thing comes down, the 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 track, it hits the water at the bottom, and it's <laughs> splash zone. When you give, you are putting yourself in God's supernatural splash zone. When you give, you're positioning yourself to say, okay, head to toe, I'm ready. <laughs> it's about position. Generosity puts me in the splash zone. Ananias and Sapphira didn't trust that God would take care of them, and that's the problem. Sometimes neither do we. But here's the thing. Either he is your provider or you are your provider. It cannot be both. So we can't hope in temporary things and eternal things at the same time. I'm either hoping in eternity and in Christ and his promises or I'm hoping in me. And so we, we percentage give. The, the starting point for many is, is 10%. And I, I believe that's biblical. And I know, listen, I, I want to be sensitive. I know there might be marriages today. And just as far as even being a Christian, you're on a different page than your spouse. I don't suggest you just roll up and drop 10% in the offering online after service and be like, pastor told me to. Yeah, your spouse is going to come after me. <laughs> <laughs> Have some conversations. And, and, but start somewhere. Start with a percentage, any percentage, and just be committed to something. Start somewhere. Stick to it. Maybe you're dealing with some financial difficulty and things aren't looking good, and you think, like, man, if I drop 10% today, I don't know how I'm going to pay for groceries. Listen, there's, no, there's no condemnation, but why not give? God says, test me. Why not just test him and see what happens? Why not just try? Why not start somewhere? Pick a percentage. Start somewhere. But I, I do believe that 10% is the splash zone. When you're less than that, it might be a trickle. It might be a little refreshing. Oh, it's not the splash zone. Start somewhere. The second thing about giving is we want to be priority givers. We want to give to God first. In Joshua chapter 6, the Israelites conquer Jericho. The walls fall. It's amazing. And there, there, are, there are two simple instructions that Joshua has given from the Lord that they need to, be care they need to uh, uh, observe when they walk into the promised land. The first one is be nice to Rahab. Different story, not important today. The second one is from Joshua 6, 18 and 19. It says, keep away from the devoted things. Say so you not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. Jericho was the very first city that the Israelites conquered. And God said, of all the plunder, of all the things that you could take from this first city, I don't want you to take any of them personally. I want you to put them into the treasury for my house. They all go to me. Now, God's motivation is simple. He doesn't need a secret stash. He's not collecting this stuff to re-gift at some point. This is a covenant. 
God's saying, if you do this, then I'll do that. All God wants is their heart. He's like, guys, I've brought you this far. I'm giving you this city. And he knows the heart and the wallet are inseparable. So he says, if you would just give me this, then I'll be able to make you victorious in city after city after city after city. When I make an agreement with my kids, there's, uh, there's almost never any benefit to me. When they're not eating their dinner and I'm like, hey guys, just finish your dinner and then we can play Mario Kart. Do you know who that benefits? Them. Not me. My dinner's done. I'm fine. Benefits them because they need to eat. I own the TV and the video games. There's no benefit to me. It's based, the very fact that I would even make that deal with them shows that I'm gracious and reflecting my heavenly father in my home. But think about it. When God, who does not need us, comes into an agreement with us, we are the benefactors. But unfortunately for the Israelites, there's this guy named Achan in Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. says that the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. This one guy, Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the Lord's anger burned against Israel. The same word used in Acts, it's a very rare word in Scripture, but the same word used for, for in Acts chapter 5 for keep back, embezzle, is in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, used right here to talk about Achan, embezzle. He took some. He embezzled what didn't belong to him. He did not give to God first. The result was that the battle the Israelites should have won at Ai instead led to great casualties and loss. And so not only does Achan's sin impact him personally, he ends up dying as a result of it, but there's an impact on the entire community. When we withhold, the entire community loses. And it's also interesting to me that he is withholding from a battle at Jericho, but now they're losing at Ai. So it's possible to withhold from God in one part of your life, but to see the impacts of that withholding in another part. And there might be somebody right in here today and you feel like you're losing in an area of your life. And you're trying to figure out, God, why is, is, are these, is this situation never working out for me? Why can I never seem to get ahead? Why is this not moving forward? And the truth is you could be losing in an area because you're not being obedient with a part in somewhere else. That's why whenever someone comes in for like a counseling conversation, the first question I ask, and, and, and it's never to be insensitive, but the first question I ask when someone's like, man, this part of my life is falling apart. First thing I say is, hey, you know, I don't mean to be insensitive here. Are you tithing? Oh, no. Oh, I'm like, I, you know what? I actually can't help you. You are, you are working against a supernatural principle. I can't, if, if you're not tithing, then I, there's nothing I can say that's going to unlock the key to a satisfied marriage if you're not, there's nothing I can say that's going to help you in your business if you're not tithing. Try tithing first and see if that doesn't start to trickle into the other areas of your life. Because listen, you can be losing somewhere and, it's, and, and the impacts are really coming from sin in another area. Giving makes us like God. It's, it's giving the first for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his first son, his precious son, his first and his best to us, we give to God first. And because I give to him first, I don't give him the leftovers. I don't give him the scraps. I give him the very best that I have. And I trust in that, that he gets involved in the rest of what I have left. I want God involved in every area of my life. I don't want to wait until I've got some spare change kicking around to give to the Lord. I'm going to ask Amy to come up. We're going to get ready to close this thing out. We're done. Give to him my best. We, we are percentage givers. We are priority givers. The rest of the team, you guys can probably get ready too. And 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 7 says, To this point, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The third thing is it's percentage giving is priority giving. It's just giving with a positive attitude. I want to give with a positive attitude. It's, a, it's an I get to do this. Like I have, I get to give. What a, what a joy, what a pleasure, what an opportunity. In fact, if we can't give with a positive attitude, we probably shouldn't give at all. Each one must give what he's decided in his heart to give, 
So make a decision and then give with a cheerful heart. God loves a cheerful giver. It's not meant to be forced. It's not meant to be done under compulsion. And this is the issue with Ananias and Sapphira. See, because it says, well, it, Peter says to them, well, your land was unsold. Did it not remain your own? After it was sold, was it not at your disposal? What is it that you've contrived this deed in your heart? Like you say, guys, you could have done anything you wanted to. It was yours. Why'd you have to lie about it? He's in disbelief. Like you could have done anything and you chose to pretend instead of just be positive about what you could bring. Guys, nobody was gonna judge you if you needed to hang on to some of the money. But why didn't you just say it up front and just give what you could? This is disbelief. You had every opportunity to tell the truth and be faithful and trust God. This wasn't about them emptying their bank account. It was simply about them not holding back any part of who they were from him. Guys, don't pretend. We can't hold back any part of our lives. This community, man, we gotta, we gotta go all in. Hearts all in, believing for God to do the impossible. Very few people live all in. Very few people live all in in the important areas of their life. Amy, you're an, you're an all in person. I know Amy's all in because I've heard her play the piano for real. Not worship piano, I've heard her play real piano. And Luke chapter six, verse 38 says, given it will be given to you in good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap for with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Now most people never sell themselves out for anything. We go half-heartedly, half focus, half effort. But this idea, can you just play, can you play something fancy for me real quick? It's like anything, just something. Okay, okay. So here's the point. Here's the point. Give it up for Amy. No big deal. She just like, yeah, she, see, I figured she'd have something fancy ready to go. I can play piano. I can't do that. <laughs> I'm a hack. The difference is she went all in. And when you give all of yourself to something, it will come back in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. She gave herself to music, and it's come back, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now, music is her life. It's her livelihood. It's her job. She's recording kids' albums and making money and raising up her kids and teaching students. I mean, it's coming back. Some of you, I was talking to my father-in-law earlier today. You know, I, he's, he's given himself all in to oil and gas. And you know what? He gave himself, and now it's coming back to him, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. He's, got, he's blessed. He's got a great life, got a beautiful family. It's because he said, I'm going to be great in this. This is the thing. I also have 10 fingers, just like Amy. I had the opportunity to have lessons. I had the opportunity to practice like she did. I had the opportunity to be all in like she's been, but I'm a hack because I didn't go all in there, and there are a lot of people, and they're not going all in in their marriage, and they're wondering why their marriage isn't working. Well, it's because if you give yourself to your marriage, it will give back to you, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. If you give yourself to your kids, it will come back to you, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. If you give yourself to God's search, it'll come back to you, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. If we give ourselves to relationships, it'll come back to us, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. The only difference between the, the, the half-hearted people and the people who go full out is effort. It's being all in. I think, God, if, if there's something in finances that could unlock the impact of an all-in community, then help us not to withhold that part of who we are, but help us to embrace and jump in and be percentage givers and, 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 and be priority givers and to be givers who give with joy and cheerful hearts and a positive attitude and just see what happens. I'd like you to stand with me all across the room. This is, money is an example and an illustration because it is connected to our hearts. So yes, there are financial implications of this talk today. But more importantly, it's an invitation to say, hey, you're here on the long weekend. You're almost all in already. But can we just agree to be all in as a community with the hopes 
that we'll see the type of unity and outpouring of miracles and signs and wonders that we see in the, gospel, in the book of Acts, that we'll see lives transformed and people set free, our children set on fire with passion for God. Can we just be all in? Can we not hold back any part? Come on, let's just take a minute and pray together. Jesus, I just thank you for every person in the room. I thank you that you are building an all-in community. God, we don't want any secrets. We're not gonna hold anything back from you. We're gonna give everything we have and believe, Father, that you are gonna take that and you can multiply our time and our talent and our treasure to do what only you can do.